It's all about the grains, man. <laughs> all right, so I am presenting today on principal component analysis, which is a uh, multivariable statistic technique that I find extremely fun and interesting. Uh, so let's get going. Uh, I was inspired to give this talk actually by a meme I saw uh, a couple months ago, probably. Uh, so just before I show it, I'll give you the quick one sentence definition of principal component analysis. And that is uh, complex sets with many variables can be simplified to a much smaller number of variables without giving up very much information. So you have all this data and you can simplify it to like one or two axes and put it on a graph. And so the graph that got my attention was this particular political compass here. And I thought, this is like, this is probably my favorite type of meme of all the memes is just like extremely detailed, multiple axes. And like, at least for me, like I actually want to get into the math of it. And like, does this meme reflect reality or does it not? And so with principal component analysis, you can actually kind of dig into it a little bit and see that Okay, to some extent, uh, you can run PCA and see that, okay, kind of this does reflect reality. When you look at the two most uh, important variables of describing people's political interests, uh, you got left and right, libertarian, authoritarian, kind of. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but first we have to introduce principal component analysis itself. So to do that, we'll do a little bit of background just on multivariable statistics, get into that a little bit more so we get a better understanding of it and introduce the technique itself. And we'll introduce it with uh, just a test data set uh, of just data about cars. We'll get into that because it's a, just a simple data set. And then we'll go into a number of case studies. And so some of these are ones that I found online. Some of these are uh, ones that I actually did myself. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm particularly proud of the ones I did myself, but we'll dig through them all. Uh, and so, but for starters, we'll talk just a little bit about multivariable statistics. So. It's nothing too crazy. If you know about statistics, the basics of it are like doing regression to fit things and doing tests to see if things are similar or not similar. So it's a way to take a large set of messy data and actually interpret it. And so when it comes to multivariate statistics, you can kind of divide it into two categories. You have your predictive category, which all kind of falls under the idea of multivariable regression. Uh, and so the idea is, you can take your data points, fit a model to it, and then for any point on that model, you can make a prediction for what your output is. And then there are some advanced techniques that I have listed here. I'm not gonna go into them. There's MANOVA, which is analysis of variance, ANOVA, uh, but for multiple data sets. And then if you really wanna go crazy, you can do this multivariable analysis with neural networks, which lets you kind of perceive nonlinear patterns or very like uh, difficult to model patterns through traditional means. Most of neural networks is Bunko, but uh, there are real uses for it. Uh, and then what interests me more is actually the analytical side. And so principal component analysis is kind of uh, the uh, parent of all of these different methodologies you can use in multivariable statistics. And so I have kind of a very basic example of uh, a dendogram here underneath analytical that shows how similar cherries, grapes, strawberries, oranges, bananas are to one another, kind of using various statistical means, uh, various descriptions of these different fruits. And so you can actually use statistics to see what are and are not similar. And so this is called factor analysis or cluster analysis uh, divided into four different clusters. And you can also look at discriminant analysis to see how do you divide the lines between the different clusters. So we'll focus on analytical. I just, I love data sets uh, and uh, there are some interesting ones in here. So we'll go through them. So the way I'm doing this for the most part is software called Minitab. I don't know, are any of you, do any of you guys use Minitab? No, I've not heard of it. It's, no, it's an it's an engineering software. It's most commonly used like by Six Sigma people, if you're familiar with that, uh, and just with like uh, like manu uh, following manufacturing processes. So you can create like uh, run diagrams, bar charts, just to like follow your manufacturing process and make sure uh, things are going as planned over time. So it makes multivariable statistics and statistics in general very easy for engineers. Uh, 
I say here Minitab is user friendly uh, for more rigorous analysis. You'll probably use R or Stata. I'm not sure if you've used either of those for a statistics class. Minitab is just kind of a wimpier version of that, but it's super quick and super user friendly. And so to walk you through principal component analysis and multivariable statistics in general, I have uh, this data set here about uh, just a bunch of different cars from 2004. I don't know the first thing about cars, uh, so uh, this is not the ideal data set for me, but as we walk through it, I think anyone can understand this data. So, and so you can see all the different data points we have, uh, MSRP, dealer cost, engine size, cylinders, horsepower, miles per gallon, and then some measurements of the car's size. Uh, and so, the first thing I do is the regression. And so I have just kind of some graphs that represent uh, regression here. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so what I'm doing uh, is I'm predicting the MSRP from the various other measurements we're given. Uh, kind of, I, I left out uh, dealer cost because that would make it too easy. But you create this model and it's this very simple linear model for each of the variables and you try to guess what the cost is. And so what I have here is kind of a residual graph of uh, every single measurement. This is the difference between what the model says and what the actual measurement is. And you can see there are a lot of different ways to represent these residuals. Uh, this is kind of a normal plot. And so it shows the most extreme ones at top and bottom. So this most extreme one, I think it's a Porsche 911. Uh, the model doesn't quite work for that one because it's just really, really expensive. And same with these. These are, I think, some Mercedes Benzes. Uh, and then also at the bottom, the model doesn't quite work out. And so you'd likely need to add some nonlinearity or even a neural network uh, to your model to make it fit a little better. And so just to go into that in a little bit more detail before we move on, uh, we actually have the various coefficients of the model. So you can see what does or does not uh, have an impact on MSRP. And so we have this one category p-value. And if this p-value is less than 0.05, uh, a statistics professor would say that it is statistically significant in terms of how it impacts uh, your MSRP. So your miles per gallon in the city for some reason doesn't correlate, but your highway miles per gallon does. Uh, but because this is just a linear model, we're not doing anything complicated, uh, they all end up in the regression equation at the end. It's just the uh, significant ones are often kind of a larger number or when they're multiplied, like when you multiply this coefficient by horsepower, it's typically kind of weighted more heavily than city miles per gallon, which doesn't correlate. Why so cylinders is significant. Uh, I mean, cylinders is, so we'll get into that actually, because cylinders is very similar to engine size. And it's just, if you have a 12 cylinder car, it's probably going to be more uh, expensive than a four cylinder car. Nathan, you're muted. What did you say? 12 cylinders is ridiculous for a car. I, That's, I, I think I there's a 12 cylinder. Like how many production cars are 12 cylinders? I, I think like, there's oh, a 12 like, cylinder in this data set. I don't remember. I'd have to like check. That. Uh, but that's like the extreme. And presumably that one is pretty expensive. Even like, I think there, I think there is one. Anywho. So uh, that's, the, that's the regression. Now we'll talk about the uh, analytical. And so uh, once again, I've repeated the dendogram we saw earlier with fruit. Uh, now for car properties. Uh, and so we'll look at the dendogram first and you can see what's similar to one another. So unsurprisingly, MSRP and dealer cost are almost the exact same thing. Same with city miles per gallon and highway miles per gallon. They very closely correlate to one another. Uh, additionally, <coughs> excuse me, uh, horsepower seems to correlate very closely to cost. Uh, and these three things together also seem to correlate closely to engine size and number of cylinders. And then all of these are kind of a measurement of the size of your car, and they kind of are on their own thing. They all correlate to one another. These things on the left all correlate to one another, and they all really don't correlate to city miles per gallon and highway miles per gallon. And when so if so, I, the, on the previous slide, so city miles per gallon and highway miles per gallon very closely correlates and highway mile per gallon MSRP very closely correlates. 
So it's not that simple. It's more for the model, what is useful and not useful for the model. So if I were to give my guess for what's happening here, it accounts for highway miles per gallon first. And once you account for highway miles per gallon uh, in your model, there's not really much point, you're not gonna get much extra knowledge from also accounting for city miles per gallon in your model. So once you, once you so I think that's what's happening there. I didn't wanna delve into it too deeply, but that is a good question, especially if they're correlated. And the whole point of principal component analysis is that correlation. So we'll get into that momentarily. Uh, so what you can also do is you can actually see, okay, every single set of data here, every single data point with every single other data point, how well does it correlate? And you can see where the best correlation is. So dealer cost, MSRP, 0.999. Those are the same. They're the same. One is just you, you stick on 10, 20%, whatever. Cylinders, engine size, also very close, 0.911. Highway miles per gallon, city miles per gallon, 0.941. And what you're seeing here uh, is that uh, for some of these, we have negative correlation. And that's why city miles per gallon, highway miles per gallon are so far away from one these other ones is because as your horsepower goes up, as your number of cylinders goes up, engine size goes up, car size goes up, your uh, MPG goes down. And that's really not using this uh, method properly. We want them to all be positive. So I'll just switch to negative miles per gallon. So I just made them all negative in the chart. Uh, and now we kind of have a better model where there's a lot more similarity between everything. Uh, so we improved the model, we feel better about it now. Now we know, okay, miles per gallon, whether it's city or highway, seem to be pretty correlated to engine size and number of cylinders. And that, that makes sense. Once again, not a car expert here, but uh, from a correlation standpoint, that makes sense. If you really want to dig in, you can see which ones it correlates to the most. So highway miles per gallon correlates most closely to engine size. Shortly behind that is cylinders. Obviously, the best one is uh, miles per gallon. Uh, those correlate to one another, but that's kind of where the correlation is. And so I just want to highlight, we have 11 variables, but their variation is not orthogonal. And so what orthogonal means is uh, if uh, we have variance in one direction uh, for, say, uh, MSRP, the variation of dealer cost is not going to be in a completely opposite direction. If we were to graph those two together, we'd kind of get more or less a line. So if the two variations are orthogonal and we were to graph them, we would just get like a random scatter plot of data with no correlation in any which direction. Uh, but if they're non-orthogonal, if they're correlated, we would likely see some sort of trend. And if it's near this 0.999, we would see a very like observable trend. So, this is the key to principal component analysis. And we'll talk about this more in a bit, but for now, we're just gonna take this data set, uh, hop into mini tab, click the PCA button and see what we get. So we do that and uh, we get this graph here. And so we have two uh, axes on this graph, the first component and the second component. And so just to explain what's going on here, every single one of these data points is a car uh, and it has a certain property on the first component and the second component describing how the car basically, what its properties are. Uh, so we have to do some digging to figure out what this actually means. Additionally, buried here, you'll see some lines and each of these lines have uh, a little name next to them. So we'll blow that up a little bit. And so now we have our loading plot, which shows what each of the individual variables do on our principal components. And so we have a first component, second component. The first component, uh, as you go up on the first component, it looks like you have a larger and larger engine. As you go down, you have higher and higher miles per gallon. So you already have a pretty good feel for what this first component is. Uh, and then if you look at this one, if you go up, uh, it looks like your car gets larger wheelbase in inches, length in inches. And if you go down, uh, your cost gets smaller. And you'll notice all of things like wheelbase cost, they move in both of, both of the component directions. So uh, we'll get into exactly what that means, uh, but what you kind of need to understand is that variation in this first component and the second component are orthogonal to one another. So if you were to try to fit a line of best fit to this data, it would just have no idea what to do. There's not a trend up and to the right, down and to the left, straight up, straight to the right. There's no trend here because these variations are unrelated to one another. So. Let's kind of talk about exactly what that means, and then I'll open it up to questions once we go through this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so what we've done is we've created uh, a number of different principal components. So you have your first component axis, 
access, your second component access. And actually we go all the way up to 11. I show nine here for convenience, but uh, we go all the way up to 11 because we have 11 different variables. And so what this you're looking at, 11. <laughs> you're all the way to 11. Uh, <laughs> your first component uh, accounts for 0.646 of your variation. Uh, and you can see exactly how it correlates to each of these different variables. So your first component, uh, if your MSRP is high, if your dealer cost is high, engine size, all of these other than MPG, if these are high, uh, the component goes up. And if these are low, the component goes down. Principal component two is a little more complicated. It accounts for much less of the variation. Uh, so 0.171% of the variation is captured in the second component. Uh, and we'll go in, I'll show you exactly what these components mean. Uh, but as you go further on, suddenly you're looking, okay, this third component is only capturing, what, 8% of the variation, 3% of the variation, 2.5% of the variation. So with two data points, you can capture 82% uh, of the data that's in uh, your graph. And it, 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 it summarizes it, that data. You just have to then understand what your principal components mean. Uh, and often your principal components are extremely meaningful. So that's what we'll talk about now. So let's actually look at what is all the way at the top and all the way at the bottom of this first principal component. So our top four rightmost cars are the Mercedes-Benz CL600 two-door, Mercedes-Benz CL600 convertible two-door, Hummer H2, and GMC Yukon XL. So this is a little dated. These are 2004 cars. I did my best to get ones that look like they're from 2004, although I think some of them aren't quite right. But as you go all the way to the right, uh, you get these cars that are powerful, fast, big, although some of them aren't necessarily big, uh, but big uh, and expensive. They're all very expensive. Uh, uh, and then as you go the other direction, we have the Toyota Echo four-door, Toyota Echo two-door, Toyota Prius, and Honda Insight, which is the one right here, which is lovely car. Uh, these are efficient, they're slow, they're small, they're inexpensive. And so you can know this by observing the cars, but it's consistent with the data we see, which is as we move to the right on our graph, we have cars that have a greater weight, have a greater length, have a greater... Uh, uh, size, more cylinders, bigger engine, more horsepower, uh, more cost. Uh, whereas as we go to the left, uh, we have cars that have good miles per gallon and small for all of these variables. So although we had 11 data points, what most of those data points were saying is, is this a fast car or is this a slow car? Is this like a pricey fast car or is it a cheap slow car? And so we've captured that all and condensed it to just a single axis on the graph. And that's 61% of the variation in our data. Now the second principal component, we can also look at the extremes. And once again, it kind of makes sense. On one end, we have the Chevy Suburban 1500, Nissan Quest, which is this minivan right here, GMC Yukon XL again, and an Isuzu Ascender, which is I believe another uh, truck of some kind. On the other end, we have the Mercedes-Benz, the three different varieties, and the Porsche 911. So this second component uh, is uh, in one direction, uh, lumbering, big, and cheap, and in the other direction, smarty, small, and expensive. And you'll notice, I'm going to jump back and forth a little bit, small and big, expensive and cheap, are on both of these axes. So these aren't quite, uh, these are there are multiple things that impact like the size and correlate to the size and to the expense of your car. Uh, both component one and component two exist on both. Uh, even uh, sporty versus lumbering, uh, that's basically my description of this principal component. So what you're, what you're doing here is you're, dis you're learning what is the actual variation from car to car. So you're using math to tell you what makes cars different and what are the, in most simple terms, differences between cars? And you're getting it down onto one graph, two directions. You can do more directions, we'll get into that, but two directions, just like the political compass I showed at the beginning. And you're simply describing to the best of your ability, what are the differences between these cars? So in your first direction, uh, really flashy, powerful, fast cars, or really not flashy, slow, uh, efficient cars on your second axis, 
big, big, big cars versus little guys uh, that are sporty. These ones can be cheaper. And so that's what we're showing here. On the bottom right, this is where our sports cars are. On the very, very left is, uh, I think, the Toyota Prius, maybe. No, the Honda Insight gas slash electric car, which existed in 04. Uh, and so that's that's what we're seeing here is the actual variation of cars. So I don't find cars that interesting. So I don't find this data that exciting that we're kind of figuring out what the variation in cars are. But we will pretty soon, once we define principal component analysis in more detail, uh, go to data sets that I find more interesting. So as a little slide in between, uh, I've included another idea of things broken down into two components. So three of these different alignment charts, one for uh, spray faucets, one for units of measure of energy. I included that one for you, Nathan. I figured you'd get a kick out of it, specifically using kilograms to measure energy. And then one of my favorites, the various uh, Yankee hats. So. When you, when you start using principal component analysis, you start kind of seeing the world in principal component analysis and you realize, okay, hey, this is that. Lawful, chaotic is orthogonal to good versus evil. They're their own things. And so we've taken this very complex description of nine different things and grafted on an axis. So I got a one slide definition of principal component analysis. This is more or less about as technical as we're gonna get during this talk. There's a whole lot of math that goes into actually doing this. Uh, but in summary, principal component analysis is one of a family of techniques for taking high dimensional data. So we started with 11 dimensions with the cars and using the dependencies between the variables to represent it in a more tractable, lower dimension form without losing too much information. So to put it even more simply, PCA is one of the simplest and most robust ways of doing dimensional reduction. And so to exemplify this, we have a graph here that uh, the data is on three dimensions. So obviously it's hard to picture three-dimensional data, but you can picture uh, things going to the right to the left, up and down, and out out of the screen and into the screen. And so we want to capture as much of this variance as we can on two dimensions. And so the way we do that, we reduce this from three-dimensional data to two-dimensional data by fitting a plane through here uh, that captures as much of that variation as possible. So what we have here is about the best we can represent this three-dimensional data in two dimensions. This is basically the only form of PCA that is actually visualizable going from three dimensions to two dimensions, but you can do any dimensionality to any dimensionality as long as you're going down. So we went from 11 dimensions down to two dimensions. Uh, we're gonna do some other ones in the case studies. So before we jump ahead to the case studies, are there any questions on what principal component analysis represents, how it's done, what, what we're dealing with here? No. Good. That was Good. pretty succinct. Yeah. That, th yeah. This slide definitely sums it up. But yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I hope I hope the picture helps because this is this is what's happening on eleven dimensions, and there's more correlation or less correlation. But three dimensions to two dimensions, at least you can visualize. So if this makes sense, you're more or less good to go. And we're going to get to some one hundred dimensional data sets pretty soon. Uh, so things are going to get spicier as we move on. Right. That was uh, so, in my head. Um, so when you talk about the dimensions, do you always compute to 11 or is no. that? So I computed to 11 because there were 11 data points. So the idea is you can perfectly, what you're doing is you're, uh, you're using eigenvectors to stretch and uh, deform the various dimensions to kind of mold them into one another. And so to capture all of the same data, you need the same number of dimensions. You mm -hmm. just try to, in your first dimension, capture as much of the variance as possible. And then all of the remaining dimensions need to be orthogonal to one another. So the mathematics of that is pretty complicated and I chose not to go into it. Uh, but the idea is typically you can look at dimension one or two and sometimes three, four, five. Uh, and you'll tell you the full story even when there are five, 10, 15 more dimensions. So I grabbed some new examples. Uh, these ones are from New York Mag and Popular Culture uh, because I wanted to kind of grab the whole, whole variety of principal component analyses. So on the left, we have the Adam Sandler matrix, brilliant versus shitty on top, silly versus serious left to right. Uh, and you can see kind of what's on the extremes for each end. And I think that's a good, a good way to uh, divide Adam Sandler uh, films. 
uh, noted uh, unexplored potential wasteland of brilliant but serious but not too serious movies. Uh, and then on the right, this is kind of hard to see, but the New York Mag kind of makes this every week. So it's their, I think, respectability matrix or something. Uh, and it just is a bunch of different things that happened in the news. What's like, what would highbrow people care about versus lowbrow people care about? And what is brilliant? What do they like versus what's despicable? Uh, and so you can kind of get a feel for the news of the week uh, all across the board on this graph. I think, I don't know. I think I, I like this. I think it's very, uh, New York liberal media EO as well at the same time. And we can actually get these dimensions, this shitty versus brilliant, despicable, for, despicable versus brilliant on the same dimension. We can rotate it and actually see some correlations here. I know, very exciting stuff. Nathan, your mind is blown. Uh, well, there, there's more where that came from, just you wait. Uh, so we're gonna do some case studies. This first one was not done by me. Uh, but I thought it was really interesting. Baseball people love statistics and they're really good at it. And they're really good at kind of telling a story with statistics. Uh, it's the whole money ball phenomena, whatever. And so what we have here on the left is principal component analysis. Uh, this is principal component two. This isn't labeled it, but it's principal component one of various batting statistics, sabermetric batting statistics. So we'll get into what all of these mean, but we have like batting average, uh, slugging, and we'll go into the rest. And what we see here is that, okay, uh, principal component one captures 82% of our variation. And if we look at the people here, uh, the people on the very right are like our incredible hitters, our world-class hitters of all time. And the people on the left are names you might not recognize, but what all these people are, are very, very good pitchers who are just very bad at batting. But because they're so good at pitching, they have to bat anyways because they got to pitch. And what this person even did was they did some cluster analysis uh, to cluster all of these into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven groups. So we can kind of recognize the best are this turquoise color, the worst are this light blue color. Uh, and what the author of this study does is they make principal component analysis one, the offensive player grade. So all of these different batting statistics, if you're good at them, you're on the right. And if you're bad at them, you're on the left. And unsurprisingly, being good at or bad at batting is about 80% of the variation. So you can really simplify most of the data here to are you good at baseball or are you bad at baseball? More explicitly, are you good at hitting or are you bad at hitting? But these principal components two and three are also relevant. And so when you take out that first principal component, the first thing I notice uh, is that all of these colors are on top of one another. So now we're charting how everyone scores on the second component versus the third component. And so this is no longer a measure of player quality. Uh, wherever you are on this graph is a measure of something else. And so I'm gonna try to walk us through exactly what that something else is. Because just like the graph of the cars, each of these principal components means something. This is, the first one is only 11% of the variance. The second one is only 5% of the variance. But in my opinion, these are probably of significance. This fourth one, less than 1% of the variance. We can probably start throwing data out at that point. But certainly two and three, we should be able to hopefully learn something from. So let's dig into them in a little bit more detail and look at what all of these different lines are. So BA is batting average. That's one hopefully we know. Uh, OBP is on base percentage. So it's your batting average plus how many walks you get. Uh, so it's a sabermetric measurement that people like maybe a little bit more than batting average. SECA is secondary average. So it's a sabermetric measurement for extra bases gained. So it accounts for how powerful you are uh, because those give you extra plate hits uh, as well as plate discipline. Walks count as an extra base gained as well as speed. Stolen bases count as an extra base gained. ISO is a measurement of power, isolated power. Uh, it measures how many extra bases a player averages per bat. Slugging is another sabermetric measurement of batting effectiveness. Uh, it gives more weight to extra base hits and home runs by scoring them by the number of pl pl plates you gain per at bat, I think. Bases gained, yeah. And then I included one more on place plus slugging. And this one is typically considered in the sabermetric community to be kind of the best indicator of whether or not you're a good batter. And so that kind of makes sense here because when you look at it here, it doesn't really affect your principal component two and principal component three. But if we dive back, uh, OPS right here, 
pretty much goes directly in the direction of your offensive player grade. So that's how we know this is a pretty good indicator of the performance of an offensive player typically. Although what we're seeing here is there still is some variation because you can see the light blues in a lot of different places. You can see good batters in a lot of different places. So let's dive into that. What are our actual principal component analysis or principal components? Well, when you think about it and you consider what these mean, uh, left to right seems to be a uh, measurement of how accurate you are versus how powerful you are. Uh, and then top to bottom seems to be a measurement of how patient of a batter you are versus how aggressive a batter you are. And I concluded this by looking at what all of these different directional measurements are. So SICA and ISO both measure power, OBP and BA both measure batting average to some extent. And so the idea behind this graph is you can be a good baseball player anywhere on this, on this graph. And in fact, uh, where you are in this graph shouldn't have any impact on your offensive player grade. It does actually to some extent, but it shouldn't have any impact on your offensive player grade. It should just classify what type of baseball player you are. So I love pictures of old baseball players. I threw a few into here. First of all, John Charles Jack Crooks is way, way, way at the top. Uh, and you know these people way at the outside of principal component two and principal component three are some real baseball freaks because they're not like everyone else in here. And so uh, Crooks uh, amassed a career on base percentage of 0.386 despite batting just 0.240 due to large part to the high number of walks he compiled. And so if we jump back, we know, okay, these people are very patient. So if you're up here, uh, you may not be the best batter in the world, but you walk like crazy. So this guy had a great eye for the ball and he played in the 1800s, presumably, where maybe there were more walks. I don't know. Oh, uh, that's one of the fun things about baseball. You, by patient What's versus up? aggressive. By patient versus aggressive, you just mean the propensity to walk, as opposed. Yeah, to, are you including it, strikeouts at all, or is it just a propensity to walk? So, it's a little more complicated than that. I, 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 baseball, much like cars, is another thing I am not an expert in, and made myself an expert in over the last week while I was making this presentation. The way you should think about this, and this isn't entirely right, but the way you should think about this is this graph doesn't have anything to do with how good of a baseball player you are. So if you're more likely to get walks, that doesn't mean that, uh, if you're more likely to get walks, that would imply that you're a better baseball player uh, in a vacuum to someone who gets fewer walks. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. And to be honest, this is the third principal component and it's not quite as meaningful. You'll notice there aren't any big outliers on the bottom here. So on the left and right, there are a bunch of outliers. On the top, there are some outliers. On the bottom, there aren't very many. So this axis is a little bit more inscrutable to me, but I, I think you are dead on is if you're on the top of here, you get a lot of walks. And if you're on the bottom here, I don't quite understand why you're there. Yeah, because but. I think it was, it was like Barry Bonds in 04, I think. He was intentionally walked over 100 times. And yeah, and I don't think I don't think he's on here, but too. that is that that impacts that. And Barry Bonds is so powerful uh, that uh, he'll still be over to the right because he just hits so many homers, so many triples. Uh, but that that impacts that. Uh, he was on the first graph, though, right, Bonds? He was on the first graph. He was all the way over at the right, and you can see okay. on principal component two. He's kind of high, so he's getting walked more than Babe Ruth was, not as much as Mark McGuire was, uh, but that, yeah. And so I don't know where he is, but uh, he is presumably somewhere in this territory would be my guess, because uh, he is a power hitter. Uh, so we'll look at two other names, two other pictures of long ago baseball players. Stephen Charles Balboni, uh, he was a player with home run power and a tendency to strike out. He was nicknamed Bye Bye because of his home run hitting prowess. So Bye Bye Balboni. He was also known by the nickname Bones. The night, whenever this was, the 1970s were so much cooler than now. Uh, but this is a, a power hitter who strikes out a lot, but he's so powerful that uh, he's still a good baseball player despite his propensity to strike out. And then on the other side, we have this William Henry Keeler. He doesn't look like a very strong hitter. Uh, one of the greatest contact hitters of all time and notoriously hard to strike out. Keeler has the highest career at bats per strikeout ratio in MLB history. Throughout his career, on average, he went more than 60 at bats between individual strikeouts. So I think over here, 
perhaps means that you don't strike out specifically. It's hard for me to know uh, versus not walking. I don't, I don't know what statistics mean what, to be honest. But I mean, if you think about is, Ty, Ty Cobb is in there, and Ty Cobb was notorious for high percentage, low base hits. Yeah. And he's all the yeah. way to the left. Yeah. So what's fun for this is you can see what type of player you are without necessarily quite correlating it to how good you are. And so you can see who the real freaks are, and it's fun. Uh, so that's baseball. Uh, we'll move on to some more case studies. I'll give you a little breather between another principal component analysis to components that seem to be uh, more or less uh, orthogonal to one another. Once again, the virgin versus Chad component versus the malevolent versus benevolent component. So I'll give you a minute to take that one in. I don't know if any of you have any favorites. I like Zad, but I am a benevolent Chad, so I guess that makes sense. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so yeah, just a picture of like the equinox or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like all the plants are aligned, and it's Dad. Dad, yeah, I don't know what Dad is to be honest. Oh, hey, buddy. A dog visiting me. Dog likes the graph. Uh, okay, so. This next data set is actually one I compiled myself, and it was a pain in the ass to compile. There's no good way to get this data. Uh, but what I looked at, because it was more available than other data, was 100 Senate votes uh, from the 114th US Senate. So this was 2015, so pre-Trump. Uh, but uh, what we have here is every data point on here is a senator. Uh, Senate's easier because there are only 100 people versus uh, 400 something. Uh, so that just makes life easier. And we're going to run principal component on analysis on this and see what our various components are. And so on the left to right axis, very unsurprisingly, our very first component uh, is 60%, and then it drops all the way down to 5%. So, and would it surprise you to learn that this first component is Democrat versus Republican? Because in what we're doing with principal component analysis is we're describing the actual variation that's happening. And so it's not like uh, it's not like this necessarily describes the uh, worldview of each of these uh, senators, although maybe it does. Who knows? But what we're describing here is, in practice, how their voting patterns vary. And the most important des descriptor for voting pattern is there are bills that are voted on by Democrats and there are bills that are voted on by Republicans. And so that's 60 percent, and then it drops down to. 0.05%. And so this, you were asking, hey, how many uh, components does this have? This one has 100 components. Uh, and so in the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 components, we account for about 80% of the variation, but there's still another 20% of the variation not accounted for. And there's not much we can do about that because there's a lot of random noise and who votes for who, uh, who votes for what. Maybe not random noise is the right word, but there's a lot of noise that can't be c captured by a, a traditional statistical model. But still, we'll look into this first component, make sure we know what's going on here. Uh, and then we'll dig into the second component as well and see if we can figure out what's, what that's all about. So the first principal component, what I did here was I took the five on the very far right, uh, which are the Democrats. Let's see if I... Yeah, I got that right. The, far on, five, the five on the very far right, which are all Democrats, then the 10 in the middle, and you'll recognize some names there, and the four on the very left, uh, which are loyal Republicans. And so what you kind of gather from this graph is, once again, we're not describing these people's ideology. We don't necessarily have the most right-leaning people here or the most left-leaning people here. What we have are the people who most consistently vote Democrat and the people who most consistently vote Republican over anything else. And that's, the, in practice, that's what the variation from senator to senator is. So unsurprisingly, Kirsten Gillibrand, Sherrod Brown, uh, Edward Markey, Elizabeth Warren are very consistently voting on the Democratic Party line. And similarly, Tom Cotton, Ben Zass are uh, voting on the Republican Party line. And then on the middle, the names you'll recognize, Joe Manchin, Susan Collins, Lindsey Graham, Lisa Murkowski are most likely to cross party lines is most likely what this means and uh, vote Democrat instead of Republican. But what you can see is this: there's this huge group on the right and there's this huge group on the left and there's not much in the middle. Uh, and that's kind of reflective of that first dimension. So typically, if it's like a random, random set of data, 
you would see it normally distributed where you have the highest concentration of the people in the middle and then it tapers off as you go to the sides. That's what the baseball chart looked like. Uh, this is more bimodal and that's not a surprise. Our Senate, uh, at least in this direction, is bimodal. So now we'll look at the second component. I thought this one was fun. Uh, and so this right here is the top of the graph. This right here is the bottom of the graph. And you'll notice there's a U shape. So the people on the bottom of the graph are very similar to the people who were kind of at the middle of our first graph, just because there were about 50 on each side. But if you look at the top, very, very top, Ted Cruz. So trying to figure out what this measures exactly, but we got Ted Cruz right at the top. We got Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, Jeff Sessions. And then we also got Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Edward Markey, Kirsten Gillibrand. So what's going on here? I don't know. Uh, and I tried to figure it out and I couldn't really figure it out. Uh, I was looking into specific cases. So you'll see like this 41 here, I looked into what exact case that was. This was like some appropriations and a Tom Cotton amendment to some appropriations bill about how much doctors get compensated for something. And only like Ted Cruz, Ben Sass, Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, Jeff Sessions, and Tom Cotton voted for it. So this is presumably a very right-leaning thing, but there's correlation here with whatever Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren is doing. So Maybe I don't know. There's also presidential aspirations. I, I think that's part of it. And then additionally, there's some extra noise here for presidential aspirations because uh, if you don't vote, uh, so if you voted yes, I gave you one. If you voted no, I gave you zero. And if you didn't vote, maybe because you're off campaigning, I gave you a 0.5. And so that introduces some noise to the data. But this was 2015. So like, yes, uh, Bernie Sanders was campaigning in 2015, but I don't think Warren or Gillibrand or Markey were campaigning in 2015. And I don't think Mike Lee and Richard Shelby were campaigning or even Ben Sass were campaigning in 2015. So I don't know what's going on here. I just decided to uh, label it cool, not cool. These, these people are interesting. We'll, we'll give them the cool label. So that's what the second axis is. It's only 5% of the variation. It's a, we're, we're taking 100 data points. We're putting it down to two. So this is kind of a weakness of principal component analysis is we don't, we don't know what the second component is. Uh, sometimes we will, but right here, we don't know what the second component is. But the one thing I do want to point out uh, about this graph uh, is the uh, horseshoe shape to it. And I'm not sure if we have some uh, theorists on political analysis and the expert horseshoe theory uh, to describe various political leanings. Now, something doesn't quite add up here. Uh, we got things in the wrong place, but uh, if we rotate it, we got uh, Ted Cruz right here as the Islamist and Bernie Sanders as the communist. So, you know, maybe, Maybe, so that, that's, just my, that's just my basic horseshoe theory analysis that must be true and definitely isn't a figment of the data that we're looking at here. Uh, it's gotta be the horseshoe. Uh, but what I wanted to do was actually uh, look, okay, how do actual people vary? Uh, because that's when we're talking about the uh, uh, compass of political ideologies, that's, that's, that's what inspired this. Let's see if we can get that. And so I'm, I was trying to think in my head, like, are there any other principal components in that that I could think of? I saw this one online. I wasn't sure. Maybe this is what's going on. I wasn't sure. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Hard to say. Uh, but uh, a enterprising computer programmer uh, scraped data from debate.org. Uh, which is a website where people upload their political views for some reason, very normal people upload their political views. Uh, and so he scraped uh, 17,000 people and fed it into principal component analysis. So this data is from uh, 20, 2003 maybe, I don't know, because it has Afghanistan war, it doesn't have Iraq war. So it's old data, war in Afghanistan, I should say. Uh, war on terror as well. So it's old data, but it's meaningful. And it's one of the best data sets of this kind. I didn't want to dig through. This is just too complicated of data for me to bother with. So uh, I just went with what was provided to me. And so when you look at the users of www.debate.org, uh, you can actually see what all their political ideologies are. So you got mostly conservatives, liberals, undecided. You got a lot of libertarians, debate.org, surprise, surprise. Uh, you got a few socialists, got some progressives, anarchists, communists, labor even. So you got a wide variety of political ideologies. How is, how is somebody taking the time to go onto a debate website, yet they describe their political views as apathetic? 
You know, this was 2004 and it's only 1.82 or 2002, 1.82% of them. They probably are very uh, like uh, passionate about, I don't know, like anime or something that's bringing them online, but politics, they're apathetic, but they still want to debate. So I don't think that's this my was guess. in 2004 because one of the topics was Barack Obama. Oh shit. Okay. I take that back. One of the topics was Barack Obama. So we're going to say like 2007, 2009. Uh, it's got to be post Hillary. So maybe 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever. I guess we were maybe done when Iraq there or something. I don't remember. So anyway, I took the chart that I showed you at the beginning, and this is what this guy made. Uh, and the primary component, component one and component two, uh, are uh, liberal to conservative and libertarian to, this is another little blank in the second component, but you would think populist. And yeah, that blows me away. I thought uh, these political ideology charts were just used to trick people into thinking that libertarians are like a real thing that exists, but I guess, there is a libertarian ideology that exists and these people have it. So I guess I'm the one being tricked or tricking myself, but we can, we can actually look at what these principal components measure and it lines up pretty well. So principal component one, this is left wing versus right wing. So if it's red, it means it's kind of more of a right wing opinion. Uh, I don't know if it's whatever. Uh, all of these red ones are things that uh, Democrats give the thumbs up and Republicans give the thumbs down, except for the green one, which reverse said. So uh, the most important, the most uh, correlated opinions to left versus right wing are your opinion on national health care, gay marriage, global warming, abortion. So these are the quintessential uh, in this set of data, left versus right issues. And you can go down. These all have good correlation when you consider that there are 40 different things. These are the top ones. And principal component two, you got drug legalization. Notice this 0.42. This is uh, much higher than any of these numbers here. War on terror, medical marijuana, and then you get into some of the social services and abortion as well. So these are real uh, correlations here uh, that we're seeing. Uh, we can see what the priorities of uh, these left and right wings were. This was presumably right around the time of the Obamacare debate. So it's not a surprise that national health care was a thing that maybe more people were aware of, especially along party lines. Uh, this is online. So it's probably not a huge surprise that drug legalization was a thing. And drug legalization perhaps was less of a left versus right issue at this time because the party line then was kind of both left and right were against drug legalization. So you have to, you do have to consider, hey, what are we looking at here? Is it actually uh, people's opinions or is it a result of what is happening in politics right now? And it's usually a combination of the two. And so the last thing I wanted to throw into here is uh, we can actually look at what percentage of the variation this accounts for. And so left versus right accounts for 18.4% of the variation. Uh, libertarian versus populist accounts for 78, so 7.8. So together, you're only capturing a quarter of the variation that we're seeing. So there's still a huge amount of variation uh, from person to person that's not really explained by your left to right or your libertarian, non-libertarian leaning. And that's not a surprise because there are 40 some different issues that are being measured. So in conclusion, uh, political ideologies, political compasses may be cool, but look at something like this only represents 26.2 of the political opinion. You probably need at least a few more components to explain how people actually feel politically. Uh, so less fun that way, but the political compasses I love uh, anyways, they're good memes. Uh, here's another one, uh, principal component analysis of human genetic variation. I think we have this and then one more. Uh, I don't know, people who do statistics on human genetics and human genetic variation, probably some of the biggest weirdos, the biggest sickos out there. Uh, people who like really are into genetics. I don't know, man. But uh, there was this study published back in the 60s and a group of uh, academics looked at, okay, Asia, Europe, and Africa. And they're trying to find the principal components of uh, people's genes, basically. And their idea was, okay, we can interpret these uh, uh, variations. Uh, as signs of large population movements a long time ago and the spreading of genes over time. And so you look and you see, okay, genes spread north to south in Asia on the second component. The first component, they, sh they, they uh, spread east and west. And then you see kind of the saddle pattern and this peak right here. And you start to notice, hey, we see the same thing in a lot of places, maybe switch PC1 and PC2, but we see north to south variation, east to west variation, Africa as well. We see this saddle and we see this data point here. And so, 
what do, what do we make of this? Is, is this all kind of consistent across the board? Is this, uh, is this really describing something? What's going on here? Uh, so I pulled this from a lecture uh, and what the lecture basically said is, okay, in 2008, there was another study uh, by researchers saying that uh, if we look at a data set, uh, a spatial pattern, uh, and we know that there is local correlation in this spatial pattern, uh, then these spatial patterns will always develop as your principal component. So your first principal component will be a gradient in one direction. Your second principal component will be a gradient in another direction. Your third principal component will be this saddle and your fourth will be this mound. And so that's, this is like in terms of a Fourier transform what you expect to see. And then they actually did a simulation and this lines up almost perfectly with what we're seeing on these graphs. So what actually is happening is if you live in Japan, you probably have similar genetics to other people who live in Japan. If you live in Saudi Arabia, you probably have similar genetics to other people who live in Saudi Arabia. And so when you throw all of that noisy data together, you end up getting these principal components in the north-south, in the east-west, you get the saddle and you get the mound. And so uh, this is just a warning to be careful with your principal component analysis. You can read patterns into data that aren't really there. Uh, and also to be careful of doing statistics with human genetic variation. Uh, there actually are people doing great science using principal component analysis to understand genetic variation, to understand diseases, but there are also a lot of sickos out there uh, trying to misuse their statistics for various reasons. So, so this doesn't anyway. really describe any kind of spread of genetics variation. No, it's not at all. It, it only data. describes uh, local correlation. So okay. people who live near you have similar genetics to you, which is at least true in Asia, Europe, and Africa, where uh, it doesn't have kind of the history of uh, colonization or manifest destiny or whatever you want to call it for the United States, where you have uh, a, a totally different uh, story of who lives where and when. Mm -hmm. So. And then these uh, patterns that we, I guess, observe are just what happens when you run the different types of... Uh, exactly. You run the principal component analysis, the computer will always spit this out. Uh, and they even created a simulation where the computer spit exactly this out. Tracking. So there might be like a little noise here, like this little dip through Africa, maybe that means something. Uh, maybe it means that people who live here are the similar to people who live further north. But for the most part, it's just... Uh, and it's, it's not telling you a big story. And that's why every continent is the exact same. And if you were to combine all three of them, you would just get this on an even larger scale. So it's, it's, it's pretty much useless. So this is the last case study. So before the last case study, I have another example uh, of music principal component analysis. So this one is actually on the political compass. You got your authoritarian artists and your libertarian artists, your left-leaning artists and your right-leaning artists or music in the term, in the case of show tunes or bot automated YouTube family finger song with Elsa and Spider-Man. Uh, but we also have various female singers uh, which ones are the capitalists, which ones are the Marxists, which ones are edgy, which ones are soft. And again, okay, we got capitalists and Marxists here, so maybe we can make it fit a little bit better if we do this. And now I forget where Taylor Swift is, but Grimes Taylor Swift is on the capitalist fall. right side. What's up, Nathan? Grimes has had such a fall from grace. Yeah, she is, is you know, oh, wow. Elon she, she would have been dangerous. presumably closer to the bottom at one point in time, I would assume. Jeez. But you hate to see it. Yeah, so that's, that's another principal component analysis. Once again, just like the Adam Sandler ones, edgy, soft, authoritarian, libertarian, not the same, but it's a good, it's a good uh, fun comparison to do. So music data, I had so much fun doing this one. Uh, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, what I did was I took from 2019, uh, these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 different publications, and I took their top 50. They pretty much all of them published top 50 lists. Uh, and I used that uh, to uh, like rank all of these different artists or all of these different albums, actually, uh, and assign a score to each of those albums. So if they ranked at number one, it got a score of one. Uh, and so the idea behind that is you can't just take uh, what a uh, what a website uh, scores something because certain websites don't review certain albums and that kind of represents the taste of that website. And so 
if a website doesn't review an album, what, what score does that mean it'll give it? Does it mean it'll give it a zero? Does it mean it'll give it like two stars out of four? And also you have your pitchfork over here giving you numerical scores of like 7.2 versus your billboard giving maybe three and a half stars using stars. So it's not a great comparison, uh, but the ranking is a little bit better. And so if you're not ranked, you're just given a score. I just gave them a 75 because it's one through 50. We'll just give you a 75 if you're not ranked and assume you're about there, even though that's not always the case. And so I took all of the top 50s for all of these guys and any artist that was listed by more than one publication uh, was a uh, given principal component analysis. If you're only listed by one principal publication, I kind of just threw it out because it's too much noise in the data. But if you are uh, listed by more than one publication, uh, you got put on here. And so every one of these dots on the graph is an album. And once again, these two components you see, they're very orthogonal. You couldn't run a graph through here in any nature. And you can actually see which publications are similar to one another. So Pitchfork, Stereo Gum, Vice, uh, Hopefully you've heard of Pitchfork or Vice, maybe not Stereo Gum. Do you guys know who Anthony Fantano is or what rate your music is? Yeah, he's the uh, the baldish guy. He's a, he's a guy who, yeah, he's a guy who reviews music on YouTube, basically. And he has a, like a fan base basically on 4chan and on Reddit. Uh, so those type of people align with Anthony Fantano. And then Rate Your Music is a similar website uh, populated by people from mostly 4chan and Reddit and uh, they kind of rate music themselves. So th this is the people's voice, you could say, just a very specific subset of people, just like debate.com was a very specific subset of people. Uh, then we got Rolling Stone, which hopefully you've heard of, Billboard, uh, NME, Uproxx. Uh, these are other like, these are some of the like uh, almost clickbait websites to some extent. And then Complex, they cover specifically hip hop. Uh, and Thrillist, I don't even know what Thrillist is. Nathan, was, did, you, did you have, uh, did you take issue with my description of Enemy or Uprox? Enemy. Yeah, they're they're well, a so real website. Enemy, Enemy now is, by my understanding, a little bit different than they used to be. They used to be like an actual real publication. They're out of the UK. Uh -huh. It was New Music Express, but I think they closed down their print publication because they didn't have like any readers. Yeah. My understanding of NME is they will they will review literally any album. They they just churn out content at a higher rate than any of these other websites. So I, I would say my old enemy at least was like hybrid pitchfork and rolling stone and then Got center it. it in the UK. And that's Got it. yeah. So and when you look at this, you see, okay, these two Reddit 4chan uh, tastemakers are very similar to one another and not very similar to anything else. Pitchfork and Vice, unsurprisingly, pretty close to one another. They cater to the same people. Rolling Stone, Billboard, they're the two populist ones. Complex and Thrillist, interestingly, you have to go way up before they get similar with anything. Uh, and so we have to actually dig into the principal components to understand what's going on here. So that's what we'll do. Uh, sorry, I just, you, you have the data points and then you can zoom in and what you see is uh, Vice, Stereo Gum, RYM, Fantano are kind of all hanging out with one another. Pitchfork and NME are pointing in almost the exact direction. So at least in these first two components, Pitchfork and NME, Nathan, are the same thing. Complex is pointing in this completely other direction. That's because, well, we'll get into it, but it's because it favors hip hop music. And then you have Thrillist, Rolling Stone, and Billboard all kind of pointing this way. Uh, so let's dive into what this actually means, because this is the first data set where uh, we have uh, more than one principal, more than two principal components that we're going to go into in more detail. And so our first principal component describes 23%, second 21%. So first of all, these principal components are more or less even to one another in terms of importance. It's not like de Democrats versus Republicans where all of it's in one dimension and the second dimension can almost be ignored. These are equally important to one another. And then the next ones going on and on and on are also important. You got 14%, 10%, 7%. Remember, we probably plugged in uh, maybe 70, 80 different albums into here. Uh, so there are really 80 eigen, eigenvectors, but we're going to concern ourselves with the first four uh, for convenience. So if we look at this first eigenvector, what do we see? Well, the most extreme in one direction is complex and the most extreme in the other direction is Uprox. And so if we look at the albums, the furthest in the direction of complex, 
we have Schoolboy Q, Two Chains, J Balvin and Bad Bunny, and the Baby. So all of these, I would describe them as kind of mainstream rap artists. And all the way on the other dimension, we have FKA Twigs, Tyler the Creator, Angel Olsen, and Lana Del Rey. And so what I would describe these as are, personally what I would describe these as for 2019, all of these uh, albums are critical darlings. So they're kind of all beloved by critics across the board. And so yes. they're very high on a lot of publications uh, because critics loved all of these albums, even though we have rap, we have Angel Olsen, who's like a white singer songwriter, Lana Del Rey, who's Lana Del Rey, FKA Twigs, who's doing like experimental pop music. Uh, but in terms of, you got a question, Nathan? Uh, this just basically seems like hipster versus not hipster. <laughs> well, you know, there are multiple dimensions of hipster and we're going to get into that because I disagree. I disagree. I think one, I think one is beloved. So first of all, I, I would agree with that assessment if you consider pitchfork, stereo, gun, well, let's actually look at this one. What is, if, if you consider uh, principal component one hipster, what is far in this direction? So Pitchfork, Vice, Rolling Stone, Stereo Gum, NME, Up Rocks, are those all the hipster ones? I don't think Rolling Stone is that hipster, although it's not as far in that direction. So My you could say- Rolling Stones. I, I have a question, and I think that we're kind of building towards this, but in terms of actually identifying what you want to call like the two opposite directions, however you want to label them, is the best way to do it just to pick uh, for each principal component, those values that are most opposite, and then do like some kind of critical analysis like you did here? So uh, that's one, there, there are a couple of different ways to do it. So you can look at the individual eigenvectors and you can see that one direction is complex, the other direction is up rocks. And so I know that complex likes mainstream hip hop and all of these other ones don't like mainstream hip hop or at least some of them don't like it as much. Thrillist and Fantano, for example, are, and Billboard are all a little bit more friendly to mainstream hip hop than say Up Rocks, which I don't actually know what this publication is, but I think it's just for like extremely white, white people. Uh, <laughs> and so there's no, 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 no mainstream hip hop on Up Rocks. So in my opinion, this first component, and I, I cheated, I know what components two through four are, but I think the best description of component two or component one is uh, critical darling versus mainstream hip hop. Uh, and so that's a, it's a very specific description, but the idea is we're using principal component analysis to see what actually varies from publication to publication. And so some publications really like to go with what is like the consensus critic favorite and some uh, don't do that and instead go mainstream hip hop. And that describes in reality what the variation you're seeing is and 25% of that, 23% of that variation. So we'll jump ahead to the next one, principal component two. And so on one direction, we have RYM, uh, rate your music, and close behind is uh, Anthony Fantano and Vice. Uh, and on the other direction, we have Billboard. And so Billboard is kind of the most populist uh, publication of all of these because they just care, not, a, not entirely, but they care a lot about who gets listened to the most. And so in one direction, we have Vampire Weekend, Taylor Swift, Ariana Grande, and Billie Eilish, who hopefully you've heard of all four of these. On the other direction, we have Black Midi, Lingua Ignota, Charlie XCS, and Billy Wood. So how many of these have you guys heard of? Just Charlie and only because of Nathan. I love Charlie. Have you heard of the about? others, Nathan? What's that? I've have you heard of the others? I've heard of Black Midi and Charlie. Or I've listened to those two. I may have heard of the other ones, but I'm not really familiar with them. Yeah, I've, I've, I've never heard of Lingua Ignota before making this list. I've heard of Black Midi, but never got into their music. And then I happened to stumble upon this album because it was unsurprisingly high on RIM and I was check RYM and checking that out and stumbled across it. Uh, but this component I would consider basically mainstream, which it's funny to picture Vampire Weekend being the most mainstream album, but mainstream in one component versus obscure in the other component. You could also say low, uh, that wouldn't be right. I was gonna say lowbrow versus highbrow to use the lingo 
uh, from our other things, but I don't think that's accurate here. I think it's more, these are artists that everyone is, has heard of and you can't escape. These are artists who you have to be like plugged into the scene, maybe less so with Charlie XCX, but these are artists who you really need to like maybe be like, in the community uh, to know of. Ubiquitous versus obscure. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly what this is, which once again blows my mind that Vampire Weekend is the most ubiquitous because they were like an indie band at one point in time. Uh, but maybe to music critics, and these are music critics doing this, Vampire Weekend is extraordinarily ubiquitous. Vampire so, Weekend is a monolith. Vampire Weekend is a monolith. Uh, all right, so we'll jump to principal component three because these are still relevant. This is 14%, so this is almost as relevant as the second one. And we have Pitchfork over here up high, and then Complex and Anthony Fantano very low in the other direction. So on one side, we have uh, Little Sims, Tyler the Creator, Billie Eilish, and Lizzo. And so uh, on the other end, we have Alex G, Jenny Haval, Big Thief, and Jessica Pratt. So Nathan, this is the one that I felt was extremely hipster. And the, the bottom here is the pitchfork direction. I bought my uh, sister I bought my sister a Big Thief album for Christmas, and she's very hipster. So I would say yeah. I, I think Big Thief is overrated. Uh that they are very hipster. Uh so I, I think that this is the hipster access. And this one is a little hipster, because like FKA Twigs and Angel Olsen on the same axis, like that's 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 for people who like their pitchfork end of the year list. Uh, but I think this one really distills uh, hipster and nothing else uh, versus Tyler the Creator, Billie Eilish, Lizzo. These are kind of more populist artists, maybe. Uh, certainly Tyler the Creator and Billie Eilish, I picture them uh, having kind of like a young multicultural audience, like. Uh, representative of a lot of people who like them. Don't know who Little Sims is. Lizzo, I, I don't know what to think about Lizzo. Lizzo's in her own. Lizzo has a pretty multicultural audience. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, and I, so I, I don't know how to categorize this end other than you could also categorize it as what Pitchfork hates. The problem with that is Pitchfork loves Tyler, the creator, but you could categorize these as the anti-Pitchfork artists, the anti-hipster artists. If it was truly anti-Pitchfork, Childish Gambino would be at the top. Yes, well, Childish Gambino didn't release an album in 2019, I don't think. So that's what's saving him from being ranked. Was he on anyone's end of year lists anyway? <laughs> I don't think if so. Ch had. Just Childish Gambino, the, the person, yeah. Uh, number two, right behind Lana. Uh, okay, and then number four is uh, Lizzo. Okay, so for starters, uh, one end is Complex and Thrillist. Uh, that's the bottom of this. And then the top is Rolling Stone. So Lizzo, Taylor Swift, The High Women. And I didn't know what this was until I Googled it, but it's like three A-list country women singers who kind of formed a super group. Uh, and then Big Thief. Uh, and then on the other end is Two Chains, Danny Brown, DaBaby, and Freddie Gibbs. And so this one, I personally consider just kind of solely the racial axis. This is music that primarily black people listen to. This is music that primarily white people listen to with Lizzo right at the top, Nathan. So that's why I was saying, I don't see her as a artist with multicultural fans. You're muted. Nathan, you're muted. Well, I was saying was, I think that this might just be men versus women. It could be. No, I think that I think that's very accurate too. I that one popped through my head as well. Uh, and uh, which which publications are feminist and which publications are not friendly to feminism? I would I would say Rolling Stone's probably the most masculine of all of the publications. Yeah, and so actually, let's see where RYM and Fantano are because I consider those to be very masculine. Uh, I guess Fantano more so. So it's I don't know. It's hard to say, uh, but I think that I think that could be right. Like I, certainly that describes Lizzo, Taylor Swift, High Women, and Big Thief. So and these are the opposites. So and maybe it's both of them. Maybe they're correlated. Uh, but anyway, I think it's interesting to see how music actually varies. So that's basically my last slide. Uh, I have a slide for questions. We can jump back if we have questions about any of the data sets themselves. But I just I I I love principal component analysis because you can basically describe what is going on in the world pretty objectively. Uh, it, it, it maybe doesn't describe what things should be, but it describes 
how things are actually distributed when you have a good set of multivariable data. And it's pretty easy to compute in Minitab. So yeah, questions, comments, requests for other data to do PCA on? I have a comment in that this presentation is like a magnum opus. This is beautiful. This is so good. Yeah, that was really good. I, I told Nathan that. Uh, I told <laughs> yeah, I Nathan that it was possibly the greatest presentation anyone has ever made. Uh, <laughs> what, so what I was saying was, I don't know if anyone here has seen The Good Place. Oh, yeah. Um, you know how they talk about the person who got closest to predicting what the afterlife is like is just some random dude in the 70s? I yeah. think 10,000 10, years from now, someone's going to ask an omniscient being what was the greatest presentation ever made, and they'll point <laughs> Yeah, that sounds accurate. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, is questions, yeah. comments. Uh, I'm just trying to think of like all the things I'd like to see broken up into yeah. dimensions. Well, so that that's the thing is that. the next presentation I give whenever it is could just be, hey, let's throw five sets of data into here. I'd have to gather the data. I'd have to analyze the data. I'd have to blah, 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 blah. But I enjoy it, so. With this data, is it possible to, like, let's say with the cars, for example, you do it for one year and then the data proves to be fairly accurate if you try and predict MSRP for cars from different years? Yeah, so this isn't, this that, what I'm doing here is analysis, it's not prediction. And so, uh, because we had the regression early on for prediction and you could build a much better model than the model I built. I did it in five minutes, uh, but, the, the answer is maybe, it depends. And that is a way to add another dimension into your data is year. Uh, and that, that's what's fun about multivariable analysis is you can always just add another dimension. Uh, and so year could be another one of those dimensions. Uh, but with multivariable statistics, yes, you could. And you could use that to see, okay, what has changed with cars over the years? Have they gotten cheaper or more expensive? Have they gotten more powerful? Have they gotten better gas mileage? Uh, so you can you can kind of run with all of that, and you can also see see how the axes of PCA have changed. You can either plug your old data into the principal components, or you can see what were the principal components in 2004 and what were the principal components in 2018, and do they line up with one another? The challenge would be finding the data set. I found the 2004 one because it was used for a statistics class, but uh, certainly would be doable. So yeah, one of the things I was going to ask and. Um, this may not even be relevant to the things that you talked about, but like the big division in statistics is like the frequency versus Bayesian analysis. Mm -hmm. is, would this factor more into, I guess, the frequency than the Bayesian? This would be the frequentist interpretation, I think. Okay. It's, it's really neither because you're not, you're not doing prediction. And so both the frequency and the Bayesian, the idea is you're doing prediction and you're trying to uh, uh, update your model uh, and so the, the regression that I did at the very beginning is more or less of the frequency school. And the, one, of the, one of the hidden things they don't tell you is the Bayesian and the frequency stuff, you often can derive the exact same relationships from them. Uh, it's just whether you use all the data at once or whether you start somewhere and then approximate a model over time, which is what Bayesian is. But that's not particularly applicable to the principal component stuff. The principal component is most similar to uh, just kind of multi uh, linear algebra. Mm -hmm. uh, you would compare it to linear algebra because what you're doing is you're taking a matrix and you're uh, using eigenvectors to modify that matrix. Gotcha. Right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, keep thinking about it because uh, I would happily do another uh, presentation just digging into data in more detail and uh, figuring things out. I think this is, I think this is very fun and very. Uh, it, it's fun to it's fun to like learn things, but it's also fun to kind of over interpret the data like we were doing with the uh, various music and argue, hey, is this is this white versus black? Is this uh, feminist versus anti feminist? Is this what what's going on here? Is it both? Uh, and why is why is Billboard so anti feminist or why is uh, Rolling Stone? So it's 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 fun stuff. Yeah, it was really awesome. Yeah. Thanks for putting this together. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I think we have Leo next week, Nathan. We, you got that from him? 
Yes, Leo. Oh, yeah, you said that. You said he was doing a, film. Uh, 